In 1928, a small group of private citizens in Dover, Tennessee formed an association to save a dilapidated building from being torn down. It was an old hotel, perched on the banks of the Cumberland River. But this was no ordinary hotel. The Dover Hotel had witnessed American history, and then it made history. Before the Civil War, the hotel had serviced traffic on the Cumberland River. Some of that traffic was human merchandise, slaves being bought and sold. The Dover Hotel witnessed the barbaric commercial enterprise that tore a nation apart. Then the Civil War came to Tennessee. In the bitter fight for Fort Donelson, the hotel became a Confederate headquarters, a central hub in a desperate battle. The hotel was then the scene of the aftermath of battle. An entire army of Confederates waited outside to be shipped to northern prisons, many never to return. Despite all this history, we remember the Dover Hotel for another event. On February 16, 1862, the hotel housed an event that changed America forever. For this hotel was the site of unconditional surrender. It was in the town of Dover in the early hours of February 16th when Confederate officers held a tense meeting. They were the commanders of the forces defending the vital stronghold of Fort Donelson, just close to the town of Dover. It was a desperate hour. A Union army under a little known general named Ulysses S. Grant had marched in and laid siege to Donelson. The fort was the key to the vital Cumberland River, a waterway into the heartland of the South. If Grant could take Donelson, it would shatter the Confederate defense in the West. The ranking Confederate officer was John B. Floyd. Second in command, Gideon Pillow. Then came General Simon Buckner. A fourth officer was a cavalry commander, Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Bedford Forrest. The Confederate command of Fort Donelson is a study in contrast. You have General Floyd at the top, no military experience, but he's thrusting command of a major army in a major campaign. Uh, second below that is Gideon Pillow, rash, aggressive, very brave, but has a tendency to make some very bad decisions. Simon Bolivar Buckner, although the most formally trained, you find him as the junior officer at Fort Donelson. Together, very explosive combination, and what you find is during the battle is a, a complete breakdown of command and a disaster for the Confederate cause. At that moment, it was easy to be a pessimist. Grant's forces were closing in, threatening the Confederate hold on the fort. The Southern generals believed Grant had 50,000 men. He had less than half that number. The Confederates now had to decide could they fight their way out? John Floyd wasn't sure. Gideon Pillow was all for attacking. Simon Buckner saw things differently. No officer would ever order his command into a suicide attack like this, where one fourth of my command will be lost. Buckner won the argument. They would surrender. But Floyd and Pillow had no desire to see the inside of a Union prison camp, or worse. Floyd quickly turned the command over to Pillow. Pillow simply passed it on to Buckner. Generals, I'll assume command and I'll suffer the fate with my men. Pillow then said, Gentlemen, is there anything wrong with my leaving? Every man must judge for himself, was Floyd's answer. With that, Floyd and Pillow left.
One Confederate officer named Nathan Bedford Forrest was furious. He would never surrender. He gathered his men and led them across the icy waters of Lick Creek to safety. Forrest would be a thorn in the Union side for the rest of the war. So it was Simon Buckner who now commanded the fort and chose to surrender it. He wrote out a note to a man who was in fact his old friend, Ulysses S. Grant. Grant and Buckner, prior to the Battle of Fort Donelson, actually have a, a relationship that goes way back to their West Point days. They graduated West Point together. They went to the Mexican War together. They did have a chance meeting in New York where Buckner was able to help Grant out with some funds when Grant was a little short. Their relationship is very representative of, of many people uh, during the war. You had friends that now find themselves on opposite sides. A great many families, particularly in the border states, that are split. And that reconciliation, much like Grant and Buckner, will not come for many years after the war has actually ended. Buckner asked what terms of surrender Grant would require. Grant's reply would become legendary. No terms except unconditional and immediate surrender can be accepted. I propose to move immediately upon your works. This was not what Buckner had expected. His response to his old friend was bitter. I am compelled to accept the ungenerous and unchivalrous terms which you propose. The next morning was a Sunday, February 16, 1862. Grant and his aides rode up under a flag of truce to Buckner's headquarters, the Dover Hotel. What happened at the Dover Hotel was astonishing. The Union victory there is a turning point in general warfare. No longer are you going to have this romantic and chivalrous notions of war what should be. You could say that war itself changed here. War was now an all-out struggle that could end only with unconditional surrender. But Grant's terms were surprisingly generous. He gave rations to the hungry Southerners. He even allowed officers to keep their sidearms. Grant was asked when the beaten rebels would be paraded before the victors. There will be nothing of the kind. Why should we injure the spirit of brave men who, after all, are our countrymen? At the Dover Hotel, Grant was creating the principles of mercy and reconciliation he would follow three years later at Appomattox. Victory had to be total, but it also had to be merciful. Grant gave orders that there would be no looting, but there was looting. Dover resident Julia Rice remembered. Union soldiers rushed into our home like a pack of hungry wolves and stole carpets, quilts, pillows, books, bacon, and coffee. They stink in my nostrils like a skunk. Beaten Confederates clustered in bunches at the landing by the hotel. Union Colonel Charles Whittlesey observed. Crowds of Confederates stood in groups in the rain, dejected and exhausted hungry, wet, and cold. They huddled together in the mud around the few houses constituting the town of Dover. At least 13,000 soldiers were now prisoners. The Southerners waited to be loaded into transports, beginning their journey to horrific prison camps. Many would never return. Among the prisoners was General Simon Buckner, my dear Mary, I am a prisoner of war. General Floyd left with a few of his troops, and General Pillow deserted his troops for his own safety. But all my soldiers and officers acted nobly. When I go among them now and listen to their cheers, it is a sad pleasure. Kiss my sweet little girl for me, and be assured of my undying love. The Dover Hotel itself became a Union Field Hospital. The injured, the sick, the dying were brought here. News of Fort Donelson blazed across America. 
The Union had won an unprecedented victory, the surrender of an entire Confederate army. For Ulysses S. Grant himself, the events at the Dover Hotel meant the little-known soldier became famous overnight. Grant's initials, U.S., Northerners said, stood for unconditional surrender. For the South, this was its first catastrophe. The heartland of the Confederacy had now been pried open to invasion. The war in the West had turned toward the Union. Floyd and Pillow were reprimanded, their reputations tarnished forever. For the tiny town around the Dover Hotel, the Civil War would bring almost complete destruction. Twice Confederate forces tried to drive Federal troops from the stronghold. Both times they failed. And all but four buildings in the town of Dover were ruined. But for local enslaved men, women, and children, Dover became a safe haven. Grant ordered that no enslaved laborers be returned to their masters. Freed men found work at Dover as teamsters, cooks, seamstresses, laborers. They established a community not far from the hotel known as Free State. The hotel saw an almost unparalleled amount of history, slavery and freedom, victory and defeat, life and death. One man had emerged from obscurity here. In time, he commanded all the armies of the Union and went on to become president. The war itself, it could be said, changed here. At Fort Donelson, Grant showed that he would pursue victory at all costs. Yet when the war was over, the Dover Hotel went back to being just a hotel. In the end, it was dilapidated and was nearly torn down until the Fort Donelson House Historical Association realized in 1928 the national significance of the Dover Hotel and banded together to save a place that mattered, a place where history had happened in 1862 and beyond. One ordinary looking building, a window on American history and American life.